Imaginary Girl, Saturday, March 1, 2014, 7.56am. Try it again, Zar, I say. We're in the recording studio. Zar is at the microphone, but not in the vocals booth. The last thing I'd need is for, say, Frank to pay a surprise visit and erase poor Zar completely. Using Zar's SoundCloud account, we have downloaded a copy of Yoda, opened it in SoundForge, trimmed the opening instrumental bar, looped it and pitch shifted it up by a whole tone. Of course, the net result isn't all that great on the ear. Pitch shifting without speeding up always produces a kind of warble which is unpleasant, as well as being highly inorganic. But the sample will be sufficient to get my point across. I press play and Zar, who is holding a set of headphones to one ear, waits for the opening lead guitar to finish before he starts singing. Yoda, you've got to take it easy. Yoda, try watching TV. I know that you can fight and maim and kill, but Yoda, take a major chill pill. Try watching Kill Bill. We do about three takes, and then I signal cut. I select the best one, and Zar makes his way over to the screen, where he watches me placing it with the trimmed loop into Acid Pro so that they can be played together. How's this? I ask, handing him the headphones. I haven't worked out how to play the music on the overhead monitors, i.e. the speakers. There must be a switch somewhere, but I can't find it. Zar puts them on, and I press play. Yoda, you gotta take it easy. Yoda, try watching TV. I know that you can fight me. Yoda, take a major chill pill. Try watching Kill Bill. A small smile creeps onto his face. Hey, that's not too shabby! He's shouting because he has the headphones on, but changes to his normal volume as he takes them off. I see what you mean about the whole screaming at a higher pitch thing. There's a big difference between singing to yourself and singing to a room full of people, or for a recording. Yep, that campfire singing thing people do is very misleading. You need to choose a key that is suitable for full voice and practice singing in that key. I guess I didn't think I could reach the notes. And so you wrote an entire song in the wrong key. That's a big part of why the live gig was so challenging to set up. What most people don't realize is that their range expands with volume. In this case, you actually had range to spare. I point to the screen. For example, check out this early take. You were so worried about reaching the high notes that you actually went sharp here, here, and here, I say, pointing at the waveform. I hand Zar the headphones again and watch him wince after I press play. When he takes them off, I add, In other words, you didn't just reach the notes, you went past them. Once you relaxed and stopped trying too hard, you stopped overreaching. Cheers, man. That helps a lot. We'll have to re-record the whole song now. Probably the rest of our stuff, too. I'll have to transpose it all. Just look at you two. Zara and I turn around to see Justine halfway down the staircase, a wry smile on her face. She's dressed in a sports top and tracksuit pants, her hair tied back in a thick knot. Hey there, Jus, says Zar. I see you found the studio, I add. <laughs> Bugsy showed me the way. Besides, I could hear someone screaming Yoda somewhere in the distance, she says laughing. Say, this studio is pretty amazing. Yes, it is. Took me a while to get used to. Justine walks down to us. She is freshly showered and smells of soap. I think this is the first time I've seen her entirely without makeup, and I wonder why she bothers with it. Her skin is smooth and unblemished. Her full lips don't need the deep red lipstick she usually wears, and her luminous eyes remain striking, even with the slight puffiness she now sports beneath them. What does your friend the owner of this house, do. Is he a professional musician? No, just a hobbyist, I answer. Before she can ask any more questions, I decide to change the topic. How about breakfast, folks? We really shouldn't impose. Nonsense. Come along. I'll rustle up something. Cereal, toast, bacon and eggs if you want. Coffee and tea. I head towards the stairs and the others follow. 8.18 a.m. I'm at the sink... Zai is sitting at the dining room table eating wheat picks, his eyes focused in middle distance. Justine, who also seems lost in thought, 
is opposite him, munching on a piece of toast. She is sitting cross-legged on the chair, and I can see that her long toes match her fingers. Much to my relief, both she and her brother have refused my offer of a cooked breakfast. I don't tend to eat all that much in the morning. I reflect on the fact that Justine is, in many ways, quite different to my initial impressions. My infatuation was, is, based mostly on an image, created in my mind. The real Justine is a much more complex creature. She's the tired-eyed woman sitting here in a girly posture. Like all of us, she seems to have both her demons and her dreams. She's a work in progress. Justine finishes the toast and brings the plate to the dishwasher, but I take it from her. I'll just go wash up and get my things together. She pauses to touch my arm. Thank you. I can't help but stare at the buttery crumbs on her cheek. Once she is gone, Zar brings his bowl up to me as well. I'm going to go and clean up too, bro. Listen, I'm so sorry about the shit last night. No worries. Let's not mention it again, eh? It happens to the best of us. The last part is a lie, of course. Nothing like this has ever happened to me. But it seems like the right thing to say. Zar clasps my hand and slaps me on the shoulder. Cheers, man. He starts to walk away and then abruptly stops. So you like my sister, eh? Jeez, what makes me so transparent? For starters, you keep staring at her, dude. I'll have to stop that then. I don't mean it in a bad way. I can just tell, that's all. Can your sister? What do you reckon? Anyway, don't hurt her. Don't imagine I'll ever have the chance, my friend. What do you mean? She dragged me over to dinner with you, didn't she? Sprung it on me at the last minute. Even so, my life is a mess. I'm a mess. There are lots of things I haven't told her. I'm not sure if she'd like me if I did. You're not like McRae, are you? His eyes frowning now. I'll never be like him. Then I don't see the problem. As for the mess part, join the club. 8.42 a.m. I have waved Justine and Zar goodbye, and I'm watching their car drive down my road. Mrs. Chu is in her garden. Good morning, Mr. Picklejig. Good morning, Mrs. Chu. Your friends stay overnight, la? Yes, never drink and drive, Mrs. Chu. Ah, good policy. My husband lost his license last year. No good. He's got it back now. Anyway, he's in Malaysia on work law. I see. Oh, well, have a great day. I dash inside. The mention of Mrs. Chu's husband has reminded me of D1's email. I need to find my ring. I run upstairs and start rummaging through my suitcase, which is stupid because I can't imagine why I would have put it there. Then I remember the jeans I was wearing, run to the walk-in wardrobe, find the one with the civil label, and rifle through the pockets. It's not until I take them off the hanger and hold them right way up that my fingers find it deep in the left front. I'm not sure why, but I sigh with relief. I think it has something to do with my plan. I need D1 to be able to carry on as normal if I'm ever going to break from this world and do something different. I decide to put the ring back in the pocket. It was safe there after all. When the time comes, I'll fish it out and print it over to D1. 10.15 a.m. Hey, Frank. I'm at the screen using Skype. I can see it is night time in Frank's part of the world. He is on his porch as usual, and the wisps of a mosquito coil curl around him like ghostly snakes. Hey there, Dan. Good to see you, buddy. How was that dinner? Let's just say it didn't work out as I planned. Bummer. I'm sorry to hear it. What happened? Did you burn the peppers? Or is the lovely Justine seeing someone? Don't tell me she's still with that corporate psychopath Ian McRae. You know about that? I make it my business to know who my lawyers are. I heard good things about Branka Markovic, but I almost changed firms when I got the inside word about the managing partner. Luckily, Justine isn't with him anymore. That's good. I heard she'd broken it off before Christmas. I was hoping that was still the case. Well, you seem to know more than I do. Not so sure. I've been out of the loop for months now. So tell me, what went wrong with your dinner? Well, let's just say it started to go pear-shaped when her brother passed out from a combination of booze and prescription drugs. Oh, I see. Dinner party ruined, eh? Pretty much. I never met the boy. He's in that band, isn't he? Yes, the people. Hmm. Speaking of music, you know you can use the studio for that if you want. Just keep it under wraps. 
When I got planning approval for a basement studio, I didn't say it was for sound recording. Local councils seem to get nervous when it comes to that. Okay, I wondered. You know how to work the desks? If you don't, I've installed up-to-date versions of our old favourites, Acid Pro and Soundforge. You should be able to get your head around those again, I think. They don't require the use of the desks. It's all virtual. Frank pauses. So, anyway, how did it end, dude? Is she still interested? Oh, Frank, how would I know? Besides, I'm still married to Kylie, and I haven't had a chance to tell Justine about that. I think it's only fair to keep my distance until all that's sorted out. Don't be stupid. You're separated. That's near enough. Divorce can take years. You don't want to waste time, my boy. Just tell her the truth and make hay while the sun shines. I'll need to find the right time. Hmph. <laughs> Whatever. Frank senses I have something else on my mind. You wanted to ask me something else, nephew? Actually, yes, one small thing. The other day you mentioned something about an adult grip reflex. What did you mean? I was borrowing a phrase from that other Dan Djurdjevic. You know the martial arts guy? Hmm, he seems full of it. Indeed, but one of his articles did catch my eye. In it he describes the tendency of people to want to hold on to what they've got, even if it's bad for them. He was talking about a physical grab. But I've noticed the same principle applies metaphorically. How so? Specifically, we hold on to stupid patterns of behavior. We find them comforting, even when they have a highly negative effect. We prefer them to the uncertainty of change. Like me with Kylie Braddon Dixon, I say wryly. Or me, countless times in my life. And dude, it's not just us. It's everybody. Sir and Kierkegaard put it well. From moment to moment, we usually have absolute freedom of choice. And yet that freedom fills us with anxiety. So we prefer to imagine that we have no choice, that we're stuck with a pattern to which we've become accustomed. The status quo, as I call it. It's why children with abusive parents find similarly abusive partners. The familiarity of the pattern is comforting. So how does one go about breaking a pattern, I ask. Ha ha ha, Frank laughs. You tell me. You just did it. What do you think you need? A plan? I suppose that will help you determine which status quo you will inherit, which universe will come up with the roll of the die. But tell me, what do you need more than anything else? I don't know, I think for a while. Courage? Exactly. And I'm sure you'll agree that's something no one else can give you. You have to find it within yourself, the courage to choose change over predictability. I think about this. Frank is absolutely right. I have the plan. I have probably always had some sort of plan. Up to now, I've simply lacked the courage. Whichever way it goes, I'm left to reflect on the fact that I've just had another abstract philosophical discussion with Frank. Somehow, we never get round to the specifics. For example, how exactly do his printers work? But then, maybe the specifics aren't really that important.